Guys, I have so much to talk to you about. Here over the next couple of weeks, guys, we're gonna be looking at the secret weapons of biblical people and how that we can actually take on those weapons ourselves today. Guys, but in order to start off this series, would you please open up your Bibles, guys, to the book of 2 Corinthians? We're gonna go to, uh, let's see, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm gonna go through all my glasses, which I've recently stolen from Leanna. <laughs> These ones are awesome. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Brother Paul has this to say. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence, well, I'm always lowly among y'all, but being absent, I'm now bowed towards you. He's like, well, look, since I'm not face to face, let me get a chance to get in your grill. But I beg you that when I am present, I might not be bowed with that kind of a confidence by which I intend to be bowed against Psalm. So he says, those people think of us as if we were walking according to the flesh. They think that this is a natural thing. They think that our food bank is a humanitarian effort. <laughs> they think that how we rescue children all throughout the world is the same thing that the United Nations does. That's what they think. But Paul says, since I'm not there, I think I need to use this opportunity as a time to actually talk to those people. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, and we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That, my friends, is the power to change minds. And whenever I talk to you about Paul's superpower, that's it. That's Paul's secret weapon, the power to change minds by the power of the Holy Ghost through non-carnal warfare. But I'm not gonna talk about him today. I'm gonna talk about Brother David. And the reason why I'm talking about Brother David in 2 Corinthians is simply because he says in verse three that even though that we walk in the flesh, we live in the flesh, we have to pay our bills, we have to go to work, there's all kinds of dynamics. We are the, just, there's all kinds of stuff. What's real is our warfare it's not of that realm, and we don't warfare like that. I love that. He says, the weapons of our warfare are not according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. Everybody say mighty. mighty. Yeah, they're mighty in God who is not in the flesh for the pulling down of strongholds. The pulling down of strongholds is a very interesting subject to me. I think if there's anybody in the world that knew anything about pulling down of strongholds, a thousand years before King Jesus himself was actually born was a brother by the name of David. While David is actually a very common name among us, um, in the day that David was born, he was the one and only David. There was nobody else on the planet Earth, and there's nobody else in the Bible who was named David. And it's like... It's a very unusual name, which indicates for Brother David that he was uniquely different. There was something different about him. Now, he wasn't different in the way that King Jesus is different. No, no, he was a, he was a dude. I mean, David was a dude. And he was not a saint in the sense that he was perfect or he was flawless as far as our definition of perfection goes. He was, he was a dude and he had tons of flaws and he made lots of mistakes and all that. But know this, man, he was a different cat. I mean, he had so many extraordinary abilities. He, when I look at King David, I just, get, I just get excited. I'm just like, man, I can live a better life than what I'm living. If David could do that in an ancient Middle Eastern world 3,000 years ago in the midst of barbaric circumstances and before Jesus Christ had been revealed and before the power of the Holy Ghost had been released to all nations, if David could do that, I bet you I can step up and I bet you I can do a whole lot better. David's like that. He is just somebody that brings inspiration. If we're gonna talk about King David, like what is, it, what is it that you think is really cool about King David? I mean, what do you think it is? Well, it might be, you know, I don't know, King David the, the warrior. Like, yeah. Now I could talk about his military exploits and I love to study military exploits. When I'm out at Redemption Ranch, all I watch is a military channel. And that's why Leanna doesn't wanna ever go out there. Hallelujah. <laughs> because she's got to watch Hallmark 24-7. Hallelujah. I'm like, I love biographies of warriors. I love that. And if you're going to get together with a whole bunch of warriors throughout human history, man, you got to talk about King David. 
I mean, he's got to be there because he's a bad motor scooter, man. He is something else. Who else? Uh, if you're going to talk about him as um, a military leader, if you're going to talk about him as a kingly leader, if you're going to put him in the, in the leadership category or the influencer category, there's nobody, nobody outside of Jesus himself that I think can parallel King David throughout the centuries. And I'm talking about he is a part of a very small people group on the planet Earth in a very tiny nation. And he literally changed the whole world and continues to change the whole world. What about, you know, if you're into the prophecy thing, you've never known a prophet that could prophesy like King David. What if you're into music? You've never known a musician like King David. What if you're into um, poetry? What if you're into songwriting? Guys, we're still singing his songs from 3,000 years ago. This new generation doesn't even know who Leonard Skinner is. And that's just been from the past 40 years. This is 3,000 years ago, and we are still singing his songs. Oh, listen, he's something. I'm telling you right now, guys, he is something else. He's an extraordinary human being. King Jesus himself actually talks about him, and he says something amazing, because even though he's flawed, and the writers of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Samuel, are not afraid of the narrative to show you how messed up King David is. I actually preached this message on Wednesday night. I encourage you guys to go back and look at it. I call it an atomic Bible study, and where I looked at a whole bunch of things that most people don't look at. And friends, I want to tell you, I went off on 1 Samuel chapter 27, which is the chapter that ain't worth reading. And it's called, the title, of my, the title of my message is called The Chapter That's Not Worth Reading. And it's like this one chapter everybody wants to run over, and it's actually 28, and it doesn't make any sense, and it's just got 12 verses and yada, yada, yada. No, you start looking into that. It is so rich with so much kingdom. It's absolutely incredible. But David's not a good guy in that chapter. He went through a very dark season of his life and he is a good guy and he's still a kingdom guy, but he's not involved in things that any of us would approve for him to be involved in. He just didn't know what else to do. Now that I told you that, I can tell you this, that King Jesus is so proud of that flawed individual because he was so extraordinary that Jesus doesn't mind being called the son of David. Now, you think about God Almighty, the creator of this universe, becoming flesh and calling himself the son of David. Like, how proud do you got to be of somebody like that? Um, in being a Texas historian and loving Texas history and all those kinds of things, I know that when we go down to the Alamo every year, whenever we go and do that, there's always the descendants of Davy Crockett that, that is there. There's always the, de the descendants of Juan Seguin, of certainly of Sam Houston, the great Sam Houston. There's all these, you know, I, I remember spending 30, 40 minutes with one of the descendants of Juan Seguin, and that guy telling me, yeah, he was my five or six G grandfather. And how just unbelievable proud that this young man was that he came from that lineage. And it's like, I've studied him every day of my life. I study him and study him. And it's like, I grew up with him. I love once again, so much. Once again, was incredible, amazing human being. And I was like, man, that's, that's really cool. Well, you take that and apply that to the one person that has ever been flawless. The one person that is holy, God Almighty, who became flesh. And he says, I'm so proud to be of the lineage of David. Just like that. Just like he was a descendant of Davy Crockett. But a thousand years before King Jesus. Like what? We're talking about the Alamo happened in 1836. This happened, King David happened a thousand years before King Jesus. And even in the future, this is what he's going to say as recorded in the past about our future from our present in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Jesus says, I, Jesus, have set my angel to testify to you that these things within the churches. And then he says this. This is what Jesus says. I am the root and the offspring of David. So not only is Jesus proud to be called of the lineage of David, he's also, crowd, he's also proud to be called the creator of David. Man, Jesus loves him some David. 
I mean, that's pretty daggum cool, isn't it? That should encourage you that you have a God that is so proud of you in spite of your history, in spite of your humanity, in spite of the circumstances that you didn't know how to overcome, in spite of those 16th month periods like 1 Samuel 27. You have a God who says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The father spoke that over Jesus. And let me tell you how you read that in Hebrew. This is my David son in whom I'm well pleased. The father called him beloved. Do you know what David means? Beloved. So in Hebrew, what the father actually spoke is this. This is my son, the son of David in whom I'm well pleased. Can you imagine? Like, well, I've read the story of David. Okay, you've read this version of David, but you haven't yet read that version of David. And you need to know, my friends, that there is a redeemed version of you that you have never known. That God Almighty is going to bring to your attention someday. And you're going to say, what a beautiful book. Who is that written about? He says, written about you. And it won't be fiction. It'll just be that, man, you were so caught up in so many human events that you really just didn't have any idea all the wonderful things that the Father was doing through you. Well, I love that. Well, I can tell you guys that David was an amazing human being, but he had him a secret weapon that I'm going to share with you today. Friends, you could study King David your entire life if you just said for the rest of your life, okay, I am going to study King David and the writings of King David and the Psalms of King David through the lens of the King of Kings, King Jesus. And that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I want to tell you, you would never tap out of that. If you were a writer, you could write a book every year on all the new revelation that you got out of it because it's that much and it's that deep. Like, I don't know, you can write anybody, write that many books about anybody. Well, a few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C., had the incredible privilege of speaking at the International Summit Against Human Trafficking. It was amazing privilege for me to go to the Capitol building, never been to D.C. before, never had any reason to go to D.C. before. I absolutely loved it. I am a history freak. And so it was like going to Disneyland for the first time for me. And God, I know what that is. I know what that is. I know what that is. Oh my gosh, that's that. Oh, I didn't know that was here. I thought it was there. This place is different than what I thought. That, 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 that. And poor Leanna's like, okay. <laughs> no, she thinks I'm cool. It's all right. So I'm just like, ooh, I'm just kind of, you know, like the president of the Ridland Glee Club, right? I'm just yelling like, look, 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 and all this. So we're staying in this hotel that was also famous to me. And we're staying in the Riggs Hotel. And um, I was, I thought it was funny because Pastor Doug Riggs is one of our pastors here. And I was like FaceTiming him and stealing towels for him with his name on it, you know, because that's what you do when you're a man of God and you have class. And so actually we're there and I'm like, hey, Doug Riggs, do you know about the Riggs Hotel? And he goes, no, I don't. He goes, I know that there used to be um, a Riggs Bank that was right around from the White House. I said, yeah, yeah, no, this is it. They turned it into a hotel. And then I said, Brother Riggs, did you know that this was the, as a, as a bank, it was the treasury for the Masonic Temple, which is directly across the street, and your family worships the devil. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> so I have a really good time with things like that, right? And... While we're there, Doug said, well, you do know that that's on the same city block as the Ford Theater. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, yeah, on the same city block, Troy. It's just right around a quarter from me. I said, no, I've never been here before. I have no idea. So I'm like, yeah, come here. We got to go down here. And we go running downstairs. Then we go run out the door. We hang a left. We go around the corner and boom, there is Ford Theater. Now this brother loves him some Abraham Lincoln. And I studied Abraham Lincoln. One of the things that I love about Abraham Lincoln from a prophetic sense, his whole life is so prophetic. Even the last words that were ever spoken over his life was this, and now he belongs to the ages. So prophetic. To me, the most prophetic thing is his name, Abraham, which means father of many. Amen. And Lincoln, which means where you ford a river. It means to cross over a river and to be the father of many. So prophetic. It's also wildly prophetic that he is the 16th president of the United States. And 16 is the number where you lay down your life for the love of God. 
He laid down his life, didn't he? Well, I can tell y'all that when he was shot in the back of the head in Ford's Theater, it was a different kind of day. It was April the 14th. And he actually died on April the 15th, 72 years after that. Actually, 47 years after that, the Titanic would be struck on April the 14th, and then it would sink on April the 15th. Everybody, know, everybody knew all those dates during that time. All that is a wildly prophetic thing. And I went there, and I'm going to see this. I've been preaching on it for years and years. I know this stuff. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And then while I'm in there and while I'm looking at this place, go, wow, okay, I can't believe I'm in this building. This is absolutely incredible to me. I went into the museum part, and while I'm in the museum part, and probably many of you guys have seen this, I was like, hey, I need to pick up a book while I'm here because every week when I'm in some historic place, I always pick up books and add it to my library. And I like getting books about the place from the place. That's one of my weirdo things. And I was like, man, do I have any books to choose from? Oh, well, there's been a couple of books written about Abraham Lincoln. And to illustrate that, at their museum, they have a stack of books written by different authors about Abraham Lincoln. I want to show you this. Well, I just want to show you a stack of Lincoln books, books written about Lincoln. Oh, my God. you got to be kidding me. Like, I want every one of those books. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, Leanna, I want all those books. Leanna's like, can we just go to the Hershey factory? That's what she's saying. So I'm like, okay. So we're, I'm looking at all these books that have just been written about Abraham Lincoln by different authors. And I want to tell you, it does not nearly compare to the books that have been written about King David. Nothing. That that stack of books would go through that ceiling and through many, 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 many more as people throughout the centuries have been writing about the wonders of King David. So do y'all want to know what his secret power is? Because if you study people and find out that people, that people who are wildly successful, you know that they have certain characteristics and certain traits. If you're into leadership, by the way, as an influencer, he's, he's something else. His influence that he's actually had is absolutely staggering. So if you study, okay, well, what are the key character traits of people that have tremendous influence? One of the things that they'll tell you is successful people always take risks. I promise you, this brother had that down. What else? Successful people possess unwavering self-belief. He believed in his own walk with the Lord. And he says that over and over again. Um, here's something else, too, that successful people have in common. They don't care what other people think. Meaning they, they know how to deal with their critics. My God. Do you know that Brother Saul called him a boy and Goliath called him a stick in a matter of about 30 minutes? And he still went out there and caved that monster's head in? Most people would be like, mm, I need emotional counseling. I need... I, I need my emotional support, Peacock. <laughs> he went out there and picked up a rock and planted it in a Nephilim giant's face. Beautiful. I love me, King, I love me some King David. Well, they think outside of the box. That's King David. They're optimistic at heart. They're always full of hope. That's King David. They're resilient, and they're not afraid of failure. As soon as they fail, they jump back up, and they get back in the program. That's King David. Uh, they have a we-can-get-her-done attitude. They say, is there not a cause? Amen. They're self-aware. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They give back. They make a lasting contribution. They promote others. All that's King David, guys. And I want to just tell you that if you were going to ask most people, what is the what is the secret weapon that David had that most people don't? Most of us would agree that it is the weapon of worship, that he knows how to worship when nobody else knows how to worship. Like he knows how to worship. And I want to tell you, though, that his weapon of worship was in tandem with his unwavering, fierce loyalty to Yahweh God and to his kingdom. He was a kingdom guy. And for King David... I want you to know that his expression and his radical expression of worship was always his expression of loyalty. And I don't know if you've ever actually put that into your worship. Like if I'm, you know, outside of the past two years, I've always had a guitar in my hand when I've worshiped. 
And so up until the past couple of years, I haven't really known what to do with my hands and how do I posture myself when I worship? Because since 1986, every time I worship, I've had a guitar in my hands. And it's kind of been an awkward thing for me. I didn't know if I was one of these people or one of these people or one of these people, right? All those people, you know? And I've been watching it my whole life. I've been up on a stage watching everybody worship, but I've always been like this. <laughs> I'm one of those people. <laughs> and I didn't know what else to do. And as I started, so I just thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll do a study on King David. How did he worship the Lord? There's a couple of different times it, 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 it says how he worshiped, but the bottom line is that it was kind of disturbing to everybody else. He got on everybody's nerves. It's the truth, dude. And it's like, it doesn't really go off. Like, you know, he, it kind of got on people's nerves. People just went, dude, I'm so distracted by the way that dude is worshiping. I need an emotional peacock animal. If you're from Texas, you get you a, I don't know, like an emotional support armadillo. That's what I need. I want to just carry around a big obnoxious or snapping turtle. This is my emotional support animal. I'm getting on a plane with it. There's nothing you can do about it. Snapping turtle. Be perfect. <laughs> so... I'm like, what, what is it? The thing that the Lord showed me is this. His worship was always about an expression of his loyalty to God. And whatever that looks like for you, if you just be like, I can't wait to get to church and to worship the Lord because I can't wait to get in the congregation to express my loyalty to him. Like, no, and that's something I have to do. That's something that God deserves out of me. He deserves for me to be a person who will express my unfailing loyalty to him no matter what. And I have learned that in whatever posture he took, like one time when his son was dead or when his son was dying and he was praying for his son to live, uh, he stayed out uh, for many, many, many days. I don't remember, Pastor Corey, remember how many days it was? I'll just put you on the spot. Just make something up. Well, I'll believe you. <laughs> so we're, I don't remember how many days it was. Uh, I want to say it was four days and four nights. And I don't know why I'm thinking that. Is it four, guys? So we're just going to say that. I don't know. We'll just make it up, right? It's like, it's like we're at one of my star parties. Well, this, and I just make something up. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> so, guys, he went before the Lord, and when he went before the Lord, it was, at David's taber it was at David's tabernacle. David's tabernacle was in broad light, and all of Israel had access to it. When he went before the Lord, he went before the Ark of the Covenant. And when the Bible says he laid down on the ground and didn't get up for four days, that means he also didn't go to the bathroom. He's a king. And all of Israel could see it. And he's like, I'm not leaving the Lord. I'm telling God I'm on his side no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. I'm not leaving the Lord. I'm not leaving him. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care if they think I'm an idiot. I don't care if they see my filth. I don't care. I'm not here to impress any of these people. I'm here to worship the Lord because I am loyal to him and to him only. Wow. So if you think my sister got on your nerves because she had a banner today, you wouldn't have put up with King David for one minute. If that pegged your cringe meter, ooh, what is that? Ooh, that's scary. It's sorcery. Give me a break. King David would have gone to the bathroom all over himself in front of you and called that worship. Hallelujah. Read the Bible. Read the Bible and get real with it. So I can tell you that, yes, he did know how to worship, how to enter in with worship. And yes, friends, he did know how to bring his unfailing loyalty, but it was all about this because it made him a candidate to call upon the name of the Lord and have God answer. And that is his secret weapon. The secret weapon of King David is not just worship. The secret, the secret weapon of King David is not just his loyalty. His secret weapon is he could call upon the name of the Lord and results happened. Every time. 
And the reason why results happen is because he knew how to enter in with worship and he would not serve another God. I want to attack a notion within the body of King Jesus on what makes you a candidate for that and what does not make you a candidate for calling upon the name of the Lord and having God answer in a radical way. But first, let me make sure that you understand and I understand that to call upon the name of the Lord means to present yourself before God and to leave with a response from heaven. You have to have that. You gotta have that within your life. I have to have that within my life. There is no substitute for that. We say, well, but there's so many prayers within the body of King Jesus that don't get answered. And I wanna tell you, it's because there's so many idols in the house. That's it. Like, I guess it's the sins of the people. If it was a sin of the people that kept you out, David would have never been able to see God Almighty answer. It was his fierce loyalty and worship before the Lord and saying, I will not be unfaithful. I might be messed up, but I will not be unfaithful. I might not, you know, hey, I didn't, I, I, hey, 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 it's me. But I will not be unfaithful. I am loyal to you. I will serve this one and only God. And I want to tell you, the body of Jesus needs to, needs to learn quick as to what it means to be loyal to King Jesus. Most of the limp-wristed leadership in the body of King Jesus, especially the American church, would, does not know anything about loyalty to Jesus. They know how to be compliant with the government. They know how to be compliant with, you know, the meanest person on the board. They know how to preach a good sermon. They know how to show you their sinless life, though they are addicted to pornography. They know how to live in that trash and say, you have to live with it. But don't think for one second that those people can cry out to, can cry out to God Almighty or call upon the name of the Lord and see King Jesus respond from heaven because they are not loyal to the king and his kingdom. You got to be loyal. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. You can call upon me and I will answer. King David got that and I'm telling you, he got it, he got it, he got it. And most people that are in church leadership do not have a clue what I'm talking about. They are more worried about the forgiveness of sins. Oh, I just made some of y'all mad. So I'm gonna unpack this just a little bit and I wanna, I wanna just challenge you in this and tell you this and you're like, is the forgiveness of sins the most important thing? Oh, listen, that's a big deal. But I want you to know, you being a kingdom guy is not a consequence of you having your, sin, of you having your sins forgiven. You having your sins forgiven is a consequence of you being a kingdom guy. Nobody talks like this. Okay, so like, okay, so where does this come from? And I want to just tell you this, man. You're like, well, Pastor Troy, I know that a lot of hell is coming to the body of Jesus. But listen, we can count on, you know, the men and the women of God that are in leadership in the church of America to be loyal to the king and to the kingdom and to serve him no matter what. Yeah, until COVID. <laughs> then we're out. No, no, we might get in trouble or we might get sick. Don't expect us to be loyal in any way whatsoever because our loyalty doesn't matter because we have our sins forgiven. You're going to split hell wide open and go, why am I in this hell? I thought I, had my, I thought I had my sins forgiven. No, 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 no. You only get your sins forgiven if you are loyal to the kingdom. Like, okay, I've never heard that. Okay, well, let's back this up just a little bit. Okay, so going back to... Going back all the way back to, say, the Dark Ages, and we go through the amazing Reformation. I'm so grateful for the Reformation. The Reformation needed to happen. I praise God for it. And I, I just, you know, those people are my heroes. Martin Luther, great hero. And then, of course, Calvin came about 100 years after him. Uh, totally appreciate their contribution to the body of Jesus. Greater men of God than I am. Not here to be judgmental. But I want to actually tell you what happened. What happened was, is they said, hey, look, we have this thing, and this is the problem. We believe that the Catholic Church is right when it comes to it's all about the forgiveness of sins. We just don't agree in how, there's, how our sins should be forgiven. How the Catholic Church has taught us that our sins should be forgiven is through, you know, indulgences, or basically the bottom line is this. If we're going to be forgiven officially, it has to be by one of the Catholic officials and jumping through whatever hoops that they want. 
Okay, so look, we're all grown up. We do know that that's what happened, correct? Okay. I mean, you know Game of Thrones. Why wouldn't you know the history of the church? You know Marvel Comics. Why would you not know the history of church? Don't be lazy. Do not be lazy. This is not a day for you to be disengaged from the kingdom. I'm telling you. So it's like, okay, well, so, so they said, okay, so we agree that forgiveness of sins is the, is the main issue, but we don't agree how they say it. What we say is that it's in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the finished works of the cross. And that's the Reformation. And it was incredible. And things really got righted in a big way. And of course, things got messed up. And I'm grateful for that. And guys, listen, I lead people in sinner's prayers, even though Jesus didn't. Oh, y'all didn't know that? There's 153 people in the Bible, the same number of fish in the net, count them because I have, that Jesus led into the kingdom. And he didn't say a sinner's prayer with one single one of them. Not one. Like, well, then why do we do that? Because it's a good way to bring people into unity. Yeah, it's, there's nothing wrong with a sinner's prayer, but that ain't what gets you saved. <laughs> and it's like, you gotta know these things. Like, you don't even believe in a sinner's prayer? Of course I do, I lead people in it all the time. But you need to know and understand this. I do believe in the finished works of the cross. I absolutely believe in the, in the forgiveness of sins. And I, do, and I do wanna tell you this, man, you better get your sins forgiven. You don't wanna enter into eternity Without being, without being right with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm gonna just tell you this. One thing that they left out during the Reformation is they left out what David taught us. And they left out what everybody in the Old Testament taught us. They left out what our Jewish brothers and sisters had taught us. And it was this. If you wanna have access to those things, you have to be God's people and God's people only. That's it. You can't be, you can't belong to anybody else. And like, what do you mean by that? I mean this, quit playing around and don't expect to stand before the great white throne of judgment and say, but I said the magic words. Yeah, but I never knew you. You were never part of my house. You were never part of my family. You were never part of my tribe. We never, you were never part of my kingdom. You did what you wanted to do, how you wanted to do it, when you wanted to do it, and, but you asked for the forgiveness of sins. Like, who taught you that? You have to love me. Guys, what is the first commandment? What is it? What's the second one? All the law and the prophets hinge on those two things. Going back, to the, going back to the Ten Commandments, before Jesus said that, what is the first of the Tenth Commandments? What's the very first one? You shall have no other gods before me. So the first thing you need to settle, Mr. Theologian, before you get your 50-pound head out and quote Calvin for the next 15 minutes is this. Will you draw the line and say, I will never leave Jesus again, yes or no? Are you a Jesus guy? Or will you say, listen, I'm a Jesus guy, but I can't really approach him on a daily basis because I sin so much and it's really hard for me to keep up with it. I got to run penance. I got to do that. Oh, that's the Catholics again. Dad gum it. Like, okay, you messed this up. You need to be Jesus people no matter what. And here's the bottom line. Before you have theology, you need to have a relationship that says, I cannot be unfaithful to King Jesus. This is so basic. David got that down. And I'm telling you, man, he said, even if I make my bed in hell, there you are. He's like, I have never one time have I ever approached God and couldn't instantly find him on my worst day. You're like, well, I just think he was crazy. No, he understood how it worked. See, the Lord was his shepherd, and he was one of his sheep. Now, it did not mean that there was not severe consequences to his actions. That's a whole other thing. Because the Lord, this is, this is God's idea for you. Are you ready? He's like this. If you'll stay loyal to me, I'm telling you right now, I'll be your God. And you can come before me, and I can answer. And if you want to live like hell, you'll have hell in your life. 
Hey, David, the sword will never leave your house. You'll be an old man gasping for breath in ordering the death of your sons so that Solomon can be the next king. But I'm going to love you. And I'm going to be your God. And there's no issue with that. The issue is, how much hell do you want to live with? Like, well, I don't, well, see, Pastor Troy, here's the deal. I don't know that I can call upon the Lord and, and, and have him answer. Well, I want to tell you who, who God doesn't answer in the David narrative is Saul. God does not answer him. And he calls out to the Lord a couple of times. And God goes, nope, I ain't talking to you. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa stop, that ain't fair. Well, here's what he says in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, he's talking to Ezekiel. And he said, hey, son of man. <laughs> I love that term, son of man, by the way. It means, hey, brother, that comes from a long line of knuckleheads before you. <laughs> I know that Jesus is called the Son of Man, and he does not mind professing his humanity at all. Amen. It's also a biblical term that comes out of David and comes out of Ezekiel, and it has to do with in line for the Messiah. It's good stuff, right? Okay, so he says, Son of Man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts, and they put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. And then he says this, should I let myself be inquired of them? He's like, you think I'm going to talk to them? It's the equivalent of this. Dude, I'm on Pornhub, and I'm going from site to site to site to site to site. And I'm like, hey, Leanna, come over here and kiss on me. Is it okay if I talk to y'all like this is an adult class? Because it is. We got over 500 kids in children's church right now. This is not children's church. Amen? So here's what's real, kids. What's real is he says this, uh, do you think I'm going to put myself in that kind of an environment? It's like, no, he's not. So God does not answer idol worshipers. That means people that are not faithful to the king and his kingdom. That's what that means. All right, so what is the next one? Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 3. Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, thus says the Lord God, have you come to inquire of me as I live, says the Lord God? I will not be inquired by you. It's like, do not think for one second I'm going to give you the time of day because, see, you belong to another kingdom because you serve another God. It's a loyalty issue. It's a faithfulness issue. And this is so foreign to most of the body of King Jesus because we think that it has to do with a set of rules or orders. And I'm not against the rules and the orders. Guys, listen, all of our cultures, we have different values. And even in our own church cultures, we put some things before other things. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is the expression of, of our walk with the Lord. And also, too, it's very real that people get sanctified unto the Lord and say, I will never drink again for the rest of my life because that belongs to King Jesus. I will never ever, ever again do this again. I'll never, ever, ever. And you're like, that's just religion. No, it is not. It is, san is sanctifying your life unto the Lord. That's what that is. So now that I have said all that, know this of a, of a surety that if you're going to serve God's in the midst of producing holy ideas and holy actions, uh, you might as well just live like the devil. Because if you're not going to be a part of his kingdom, and if you're not going to be a kingdom guy, you will forever approach him and he will not answer you. The reason why God didn't answer Saul is simply because he worshiped other gods. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, the Bible says that he built an altar unto Yahweh because of political, you know, pressure. And he got up there and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mind you, he would leave there and he would go kill 85 of Yahweh's priests. Right? Same knucklehead. But like, okay, well, he did make an altar to Yahweh and he did serve him. Okay, here's what, here's what the writer of 1 Samuel says. It says this, and this was the first altar he had built to Yahweh. I'm like, okay, why is that a big deal? Because he builds an altar to Elohim in the, thir in the 13th chapter. Because he builds an altar to Elohim. Like, well, isn't Elohim God? Sometimes. But Elohim just means spiritual person. So the first time, he built an altar to Yahweh, the Elohim of Elohim, or the King of Kings, or the God of Gods, or the Lord of Lords, right? The Alpha and the Omega, the one that created everything. He had already been worshiping other gods. There's a time that he has a daughter, and Mikal, and she's like, David, dude, they're going to come kill you. And she had seen the movie Escape to Alcatraz, and she put the idol in there, and she put hair on top of his head. And they said, who is that in there? And they're like, it's King David. Like, okay, like, I will not disturb him. Then after a few 
days, they pulled back, you know, and said, dude, it's one of Saul's idols. He has idols in his house. He does not serve Yahweh. He is not loyal to King Jesus. He does not serve the Lord, his God. He serves Dagon, or he serves Bel, or he serves Moloch, or some other Nephilim hybrid. And it's like, what are you doing? Yeah, well, I can tell you I can go on and on, but I can tell you this, that in the book of Hosea, in chapter 13, verse 11, he says, he says you guys, I told you do not get a king that, because they'll worship other gods. He said, well, I gave you a king, and I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13 says, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness. The Hebrew word there for unfaithfulness means he worshiped other idols. Like, oh, so he never served God to begin with. No, he didn't. He was anointed of the Lord as a vessel of God, but he never was loyal to God, ever. David was. And David was a man after God's own heart. David was a dude that just went, you know what? I belong to God and I don't belong to any other and you're not gonna shake me from this. So David would go before the Lord and he'd call upon the name of the Lord his God, meaning he would come before him and say, I belong to you and you belong to me. And he would worship his way into that place, declare his allegiance. And that's why he says, search me, O Lord. If there's anything wicked within me, cast me out. He's not saying, look at my day and make sure I was perfect. David would never do that. Do you think there was ever a day that David lived that he could come before the Lord and say, God, check out what an awesome, sinless day I live today? It wasn't the point. The point when he'd say, okay, Lord, I'm coming before you and I'm asking God to search my heart and you see if I'm not 100% devoted to you. 10,000%. And he says, and God says, yes, ask what you want. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So that makes you want to cry out to God, doesn't it? It makes you want to just go, go a little bit crazy. It makes you want to just go, okay, look, I belong to Jesus. The reason why I don't approach the throne of God near enough is because I have a list of my own righteousness and a list of my own unrighteousness. And guys, I'm not... See, I want to get a lot of hate mail and say, man, this devil just telling everybody to walk in sin. Oh, shut up, you religious knucklehead. That is not what I'm saying. I'm telling you this, that if you live like hell, you'll have hell in your life, and we'll all have to bear the consequences of it. I am sick and tired of cleaning up other people's messes because they're too big a wimps to walk with God. Amen. I am not saying that. That's not what I'm saying that. What I'm saying is this. If you want to believe that your sins are forgiven, you have to believe that God Almighty is 100% with you and you are 100% with him. And you do that through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And like, well, I don't think I've ever heard it like that. That's because I'm not trying to control you. You don't need me at all. You don't need my approval. You don't need nothing from me whatsoever. I am not the mediator between you and God Almighty. I refuse to be that for you. What I will be is a full demonstration of freedom, redemption, and the goodness of God. That's what I'll be. And I'm going to come at you warts and all. And I'm going to do what God has called me to do and double dog dare you to do what it, double dog dare you to do what God's called you to do. And to just be honest and real about it and go, okay, what's well, so I'm responsible for my behavior, but I'm not using my behavior as an excuse or an inexcuse to come into the presence of the Lord. That's what King David teaches me, is that. There have been times in my life, I, 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 I want to express this to you. In the midst of all the flaws that I have, and if you're like, man, I wonder what all flaws he has. I've already told you 10,000 times. And you ain't got to be around me five minutes to find out. <laughs> it's like, I'm just not very churchy and I don't say the right things and I get mad. Like, you shouldn't get mad. Mm -hmm, I should get mad. I'm scared of not being mad. I'm serious. I'm scared of being involved in the things I'm involved in and not being mad and going, no, not on my watch. No, I'm a good husband. I am. I'm not the greatest husband in the whole world. 
but I'm probably better than everybody else in here. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm funny, and that's probably a flaw I have. Um, I think a lot of inappropriate things are funny. Um, uh, I, I could name some other obvious warts that I have. They're like, why don't you work on that? Because I kind of like them. You know, I was like, I can live with it. <laughs> now that I've said all that, here's what I can tell you about me. In spite of me, I promise you, I promise you, I am loyal to King Jesus. And I'm talking about in a strange kind of way that the Lord taught me and men did not teach me. Now that I've said that, I can also tell you this too. I have this superpower. I know how to call upon the name of the Lord and see him change everything. And I've seen it. And I'm talking about in ridiculous ways. Have I seen it? I'm talking about in, oh my gosh, I'm not sure I believe that story kind of ways. And many of you have had a front row seat to see it. And it's not because of anything great that I've done. It has just been simply because I know how to call upon the name of the Lord and get saved. Not meaning saved as far as my salvation is. Save me out of this circumstances. Save me from this situation. Save me from this. Save me from that. The word of God says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. Psalms 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, are there any 333 people in here? You see it everywhere you go. Come on, here's a verse for you. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things that you know not of. Man, I like that. Psalms 91, verse 15, when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. I will honor him. Jeremiah 29, 12, then you will call upon me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear you. Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. While they're still speaking, I will hear. Okay, there's so many verses. Guys, in my notes, all of my sermon notes are available to everybody here at ODX. You can, if you can find my sermon, you can click on the little sermon note tab. I included like several hundred of these scriptures in there for you. Now, I know how to seek the Lord and go, I'm not coming to you because I deserve it as far as I'm sinless. I'm coming to you because I qualify because I'm all the way into your kingdom. And me as a knucklehead boy, if I am all the way in, how much more so will you be all the way in because you're holy and you're righteous? Coming before the Lord, I don't think that God owes me a single thing. I think that God offers me everything and says, I dare you to believe me. Amen. In fact, I've actually had really confusing things that have happened with me where I have pressed him boldly and mightily into the presence of the Lord and God answered. And I thought because it was so obvious something was going on in my life that shouldn't be going on, that it was God's approval. And as soon as he blessed me, he spanked me in this other part of my life in a really bad way. So have you ever got the blessing from the Lord and the spanking from the Lord at the, at the same time? You're like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. It's like, well, you called upon me and I answered. You screwed around and now you get a spank. I told you don't touch that. I told you don't mess with it. I told you, I told you. But Lord, you're blessing my socks off. That's right. You called upon me and I answered. Now I'm going to spank your honey. And it's been like, okay, I, I'm not sure I'm doing everything right. No, you're doing things right in that place. You're doing things right in that place. I'm telling you, you are. So I can tell you that in, in whenever we first started Open Door, it was like one of the key things is that I would go and seek the Lord. You know, Pastor Gloria has that legacy. And I'm telling you, if Pastor Gloria goes to go pray, you better be right with her. Because if she brings you before the Lord, you're liable to get a bad spank. I've been scared of that woman since the day we came in this place. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, she's looking at me right there. She loves me with all of her heart, and I have her favor, and I want to keep it like that. I promise her, hmm, that woman will come before the Lord. He'll be like, man, that's my, that's my daughter. And I know that because of Leanna. And I've gotten so many fights through the years with Leanna, and Leanna says, I'm done talking to you. I'm going to go talk to Jesus. I'm like, don't be bringing Jesus into this fight. 
I'm like, no, I want to fight. I just, just tell me what you think. And I just sit here and listen, don't go talk to Jesus. You're like, no, no, I'm talking to Jesus. And I just remember just fear coming up on me, man. Like, oh no. <laughs> so true. Well, we, we saw God do amazing things. And, and, and then in 2009, our church started to really grow. And when I say really grow, you know, our, our room would hold like 100 people. And so we were having to have a Saturday night service and three Sunday morning services. And guys, I was the youth pastor. I was the children's pastor. I was the worship leader. I was the outreach pastor. And I was the senior pastor. And it was just a lot. And I was like, man, this is going to kill me. We're just doing so much, man. So some, some really awesome business people started coming to my church and they were willing to have four wheel drives when it rained because you couldn't get in our church parking lot unless you had a four wheel drive. They were okay with our neighbor's goats getting on their cars. That was a part of the open door experience in those days. <laughs> it's a true story. Had so many people leave our church. If I'm never coming to your church again, there were goats on my car. I'm like, what's the problem? <laughs> so embarrassing. It wasn't my ghost, my neighbors. So <laughs> all this, and they're like, hey, you need to get a new building. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, okay, we know the building to get, and it's in uh, downtown Joshua, Texas. 15 years before that, uh, in the year 1995, Operation Blessing had blessed me with four truckloads of food a month, which is four 18-wheelers, 52 feet long of food. Uh, about, you know, uh, 30 to 40,000 uh, pounds a piece of food. And we were doing tremendous monster outreaches. So we had a tiny, tiny, tiny church, probably like 20 people in our church at that time. And we were just feeding so many people and it was glorious. So I went to the big church that was in town, went down there. I asked to speak to the pastor. The pastor brought me before his board. I had actually been baptized in that church, um, knew some of these people um, that were in leadership. And the, this one pastor says, hey, I remember you, weren't you number 77 in, uh, in, in football? And I'm like, yes, sir, I was. And he goes, you also rodeoed, right? And I said, yes, sir, I did. And he goes, you're that guy that you played with a broken arm and tried to hide it from everybody, right? And I, was, I, I said, no, no, sir, that was a, I had a broke ankle. I tried to play football with a broke ankle. And he's like, okay, I do remember you, man. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. Like, we just bandaged it all up. I had a cast on. I could just wear baggy clothes. But I was like, I, I couldn't, yeah, all I, anyway, I didn't have any sense. So he said, what can I do for you, Troy? And I said, well, sir, uh, I was actually baptized in this church when I was a little boy. This church is the happening church. This church is an amazing church. You guys have such a legacy and testimony here. I'm the new guy and I'm out in the middle of the boonies. And, you know, we don't have really anything to offer anybody except for we love Jesus with all of our heart. You have such a great facility. You have kids church, you have all kinds of stuff. And we know too that people trust you and um, I would like to offer you as much food as you want to feed the people in Joshua, Texas, to feed whoever needs food. All the isolated elderly people, um, all the young families, anybody said, I got enough food to feed everybody. And he's like, how do you propose we do that? And I said, well, if we can use the parking lot next door, I'll come and bring the trucks. You can bring a team. If you don't have anybody that wants to do this, I'll bring my own team. We will wear a shirt that says your church. I will wear a hat that says your church. And we'll do this for y'all because we're going to be doing this anyway outside of town. And he said, really? He goes, you're going to give us the food for free? No strings attached. I'm like, no, sir. No, no strings attached. And he goes, and you guys are going to come out here and work on Saturdays and feed people and invite people to our church? I said, yes, sir, I am. And he goes, well, how many people do you think are going to be inviting to our church? And I said, well, you know, several hundred families every single Saturday. And then he sat there and he goes, Troy, you are a straight shooter and I appreciate that. And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, I'm going to tell you what none of these other people here will be willing to tell you. And I said, what? And he said, we don't want those people coming to our church. And I said, why? And he said, because if you're going to start bringing in all these people who are super, super needy and they're going to come to church here, they're going to run off the people that are not needy and we're going to have a whole church and no way to be able to do what it is that we do. And I looked over at his board and I looked back at him and I said, well, you can, you know, you'll compensate that because you'll tell people that people are getting saved and 
and, and all that kind of stuff. And that'll cause other people to come to the church. He goes, people are already getting saved. And I said, well, I don't know what to say to that. And I was a very young man and he was an old man. And I, I was like, well, I don't, I don't know what to say. He goes, listen, son, you don't need to say anything. Just, you know what, we'll, we'll put on some flyers. And if any poor people come to us, we'll just send them to y'all. So he told me. And I was devastated. I was so upset. Well, fast forward 15 years, 2009, what are we gonna do? Hey, business guy in my church says, hey man, I know, I know exactly what you can do. He said, what? You know that church, that big church that's in town? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, they're done. And he goes, I know that they wanna get out from under it. I know the people that are there. And he said, here's what you do. I said, bro, I don't have any money to go be, buy me another building, especially in downtown Joshua. There ain't no way. And he said, no, there is a way. So what? He said, let's go over there and let's offer them X amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it was nothing. It, it was about one third of what it was worth. And he goes, let's offer them that. And I said, well, I don't have any money to be able to do that. He goes, don't worry. You, we'll tell them we don't have any money for no down payment and they need to tell the note. <laughs> I said, okay. What else? And he said, Let's tell them they need to be out by October because, man, we need to have a good fall season in that church. I said, okay. Now, we've been before the Lord. We've been crying out to God. I know how to go before God. I know how to cry out to him because the word of God says that if I will call upon the name of the Lord, he will answer me. And I was calling upon the name of the Lord. and said, Lord, I have no solution to this building issue. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And so this guy, this business guy, shows up out of nowhere who's mean, I said, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Do this, this, this. So we go over there. He introduces me to the board. I sit there and I talk. We're shooting the bull. And I tell him, hey, guys, I was baptized in this church and yada, yada, yada. And very aware of this church. Love this church. We'd like to move into town. Um, we'd like to do this. We'd like to do that. Um, we're bringing in, uh, you know, maybe 600 people with us. And it's going to be a big momentum. And, man, you know, we're going to stick a new banner in the ground. And we're going to, we're just going to breathe life into y'all's legacy. And he says, okay, well, what do you want us to do? And I looked over at the mean guy and he looked back at me and like, tell him. I said, well, we wanna pay, we'd like to buy this building for X amount of dollars. And they all just got real quiet. And we'd like for you to tote the note because we don't have any money for down payment. And we'd like for you guys to be out by October um, <laughs> because we really need to move in here and God needs to do something awesome. And they looked at me and they were looking at me and they're like, are you, are you kidding me? And I was like, he told me to say this. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. And this guy was their friend. I was like, he told me to say this. Like, I, I told him it wasn't going to work, man. And they're like, Pastor Brewer, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And yeah, we'll consider what you have to say. Thank you very much. Have a great day. They walked me out to the door. It's great having you here. Really great. I'm just kind of walking out going, that's so stupid. I get almost home, almost into my driveway. My phone rings. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Pastor Brewer, could you turn around and come back and talk to us? I'm like, why? Well, we'd like, to, we'd like to consider entertaining your offer. Would you come back and talk to us about it? So I go back. I drive like, you know, an angel out of heaven. <laughs> Some of y'all from the other side of the tracks, you know the other version of that. I'm, so I get there and I go pull in there. I walk in there and I'm like, okay, what? And they're like, yeah, listen, if we sell this building to you for this amount. And if we tote the note on it, and if we're out by October, would you be willing to do this, this, and this? And I said, guys, I don't have to take over this building for me to do those things for y'all. I, I have the ability to help you right now. Whether you wanna do business or not, you just ask and I'll help you with those things. And they said, are you serious? I'm like, I'm, I'm serious. And they went, well, you just bought yourself a building. Now, I was sitting there looking at him like, what I do? <laughs> I'm like, what? What just happened there? Yeah, you just bought yourself a building. We're gonna do all that and we're gonna leave and go to the school and then we're gonna build another building and we're gonna do something else. Like, okay, that's craziness. So I said, what changed? What changed from the time that I left to the time that I came back? What in the world was that? And he said, well, it wasn't any of us, it was him and this old man was sitting over there minding his, old, his, his own old business. And he had his old legs crossed and he was sitting there and he was watching all this through his really thick glasses. And I didn't recognize him. And I said, hey, I remember you. 
He said, hello, Mr. Brewer. And I said, my goodness. I said, well, what, what changed? And he said, we'll tell you what changed. That guy right there, after you left, we were all laughing about what a ridiculous offer you made. And he was just sitting there and we said, well, what do you think? And he said, I can remember the day that our church went into decline 15 years ago. I can remember the day that we went from this to that. And it was the last time that that kid walked in here. And I say, I say we get, I, I say we repent. And I say we give him anything he wants. And I say we tell God we're sorry for not receiving the poor like what he offered us to do years and years and years ago. It was crazy. Guys, we were in that building for two years and then Pastor Gloria gave us this building. This building was given to us. And we were able to give the other ones away. And all the stuff that was in it, the chairs, the PA systems, everything. Now in the first building, you got our old chairs and the two 30 inch televisions that was hanging from the ceiling. That's not, not quite as big as what we have now. We had two 30-inch TVs hanging down. Guys, I want to just tell you this. If you don't get anything else out of this message, know this. If you'll be loyal to the Lord, and if you'll be serious about his kingdom, and if, if your heart will burn within you because of how Jesus loves people, you can call upon the name of the Lord, and he will answer. Guys, let's give Jesus a great big praise. It's so good. It's a great secret weapon. Everybody stand up. My goodness, we got to get out of here. It's starting to get hot in here. How many of y'all know? Hey, am, am I still on the television show? Are we done? Y'all hang on. Absolutely. All right. Father God, sir, we declare our loyalty to you. God, we declare our loyalty to you, Lord God, sir. We are kingdom people. We love you, Lord Jesus. God, have mercy on us. Yes, Lord God, thank you, sir, for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making us pure and, and holy, Lord God, before you. Thank you, God, for your blood. Yes, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, Lord God, make sure, God, that we're all the way into your kingdom. King Jesus, sir, we love you and no other. We serve you and no other. We love you and no other. We serve you and no other. None but Christ, none but Christ, as Tyndale said as he was burning to death at the stake. None but Christ, none but Christ, none but Christ. We declare our loyalty to you, Lord God. God, make that so real to us, God. And give us the confidence and the grace to boldly come before your throne, knowing, God, that you will indeed answer those who call upon your name. Let there be healing. We love you, Lord God, and we praise you, sir. In Jesus' name, everybody here stay together.